Yeah, I think it's just about as good a time as any for a little change up, don't you? For today, we're just gonna do a little introduction for this show, take a look at some of its behind the scenes stuff, which of course will also detail some of its source materials history both before and after its conclusion, as well as how it kind of served as a bit of a warm up for future Precure series. Yes, much like Gojama Jodoremi, much of the behind the scenes stuff had strong ties to that franchise including some future writers and animators, all for a couple of shows about superheroines who enjoy a tad bit of the fisticuffs. With all that in mind, let's take a look at the creation of Toy Animation's take on a Cartoon Network classic with Powerpuff Girls Z. You know, now that I think about it, I might have brought up this series at least once before. Powerpuff Girls Z. Eh, still a better representation of the girls than the new reboot. One of the few jokes in my library that aged really damn well. I'll admit though, back then I only watched bits and pieces of the 2016 reboot, and therefore I couldn't with all honesty give an objective critique of that show. So since then I have watched a little more, and by more I mean just one episode and that was enough. In this one episode there was just so, so much wrong, and I'm not just talking about the Jared stuff, that was certainly an issue where they really should have considered the optics of having a character based on an actual person and a member of the staff, but I'm talking more about stuff like the boring as all hell plot that barely had any real superhero stuff in it, the awful designs of the characters and backgrounds that made it very apparent that they just plucked characters from a highly stylized 90s Hanna-Barbera cartoon and plopped them in a low effort over homogenized modern cartoon. Seriously, who is the idiot who made Bean Mouths a thing? And worst of all, I know for a fact that this makes up a significant portion of this show's content. Remember two weeks ago when I made that mojo meme generator? How do you do, fellow kids? And I know using that they rock clip makes me just as guilty of using memes for my comedy, but you know, at least I'm a no budget YouTuber who doesn't waste a ton of money or a beloved license. And really, I think that's the greatest sin that all of these modern reboots commit. They waste the licenses they were gifted by failing to take advantage of the legacies they had created and instead try to create their own OG creations and pretend like they've created the superior product while still banking on the original. God, if that meme from earlier didn't make me look like a total boomer then that little rant probably did. Point is that while I wouldn't consider myself a huge PPG fan, I do think I've seen enough of it that I can understand what about the original appeal to many. To be exact, I watched the original four seasons that were headed by show creator Craig McCracken before he went off to work on Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. Which was probably for the best based on what I've heard of the latter seasons, but let's not overload this video by talking about all of the bad elements of this franchise. On the subject of Craig, in a documentary, I think he summed up the concept of not just the Powerpuff Girls, but also the magical girl genre as a whole perfectly with... They'll, they'll seem much stronger and much more heroic in contrast because they look so innocent and, and harmless. This was on top of him understanding that animation can be for everyone, not just kids. In fact, part of the reason they created the movie in 2002 was because Craig felt that the series had become overly commercialized and wanted to bring it back to its roots. Sentiments that certainly don't carry over into the reboot. Unfortunately, the film did bomb, though I blame that more on poor marketing and freaking MIB2 coming out that same weekend. Again, I was never the biggest fan of that series, but I would have watched that movie a hundred times over that unfunny train wreck. And if anything, I do applaud Craig for sticking to his principles and original concepts. Concepts that I feel that the reboot and a certain other franchise I review on a weekly basis sometimes forget. Speaking of which, I do wonder if PBG had any influence on Precure, considering it predated it by about 6 years, even more if you count the original Wella cartoon shorts. It certainly found resounding success in Japan thanks to airing the original 4 seasons weekly on TV Tokyo for almost the entire year of 2001. Yeah, I got the full on big name anime treatment on one of the biggest television networks in that country. Granted, TV Tokyo has aired several Japanese dub western cartoons on their channel, but I can't think of many that got a full weekly airing schedule like PPG did. 
It's really rare where a western cartoon is treated like such a holy grail, but that goes to show how much this connected with people. And in case you're wondering, the remaining two seasons aired only on Cartoon Network Japan and was called Powerpuff Girls Underground, as if they knew the show wouldn't be the same without Craig McCracken. Same with the 2016 reboot, rightfully. And maybe that's the reason CN Japan told Toy not to try and recapture lightning in a bottle. In 2004, Powerpuff Girls Underground, I can't get over that title, had wrapped up. So the following year, Cartoon Network Japan commissioned Toy Animation to, and I quote, make an Asian version of the Powerpuff Girls, don't mind the source material, and just feel free to do what you want. As a result, longtime Ojama Doremi producer Hiromi Seki pitched the concept of erotic cool. Well, they certainly did that with one of their characters. With that, they produced a pilot that was shown at the 2005 Tokyo Anime Festival, and while not all of these concepts were utilized, like the girls having big jackets or them using their weapons as transformation trinkets, eh, I see nothing wrong with that. The show was greenlit and would start airing once again on TV Tokyo in July of the following year. This would result in a show that, while certainly having Powerpuff Girl elements and influences, it was ultimately its own show. Which again, I can respect a lot more than this abomination. Also, fun fact, many had a hard time believing this was actually going to be a thing, mostly because they chose to announce this on April 1st of all days. Yeah, big brain move there, guys. Though really, it is hard to blame people for being a little skeptical, because when you get right down to it, the original PBG is timeless and doesn't need to be rebooted. It got like three satisfying enough conclusions with final confrontations with either him, Mojo Jojo, or a factious gnome. Again, I didn't watch the sixth season, I just know how insane that ending was. But yeah, I think Toy and C in Japan did the wise thing by basically creating their own Elseworlds for the PPG. Said world turned out to be one with magical girls because that's just kind of Toy's thing. In fact, at the time, they were still in the middle of producing Futaiwa Precure Splash Star, which likely did bring in a couple of issues for this show. For one, not only would they have a limited budget, as that still fresh cash cow took priority, but they also likely would have wanted to do something different from Precure, which again, in many ways, was already kind of the Asian version of the PBG. So then, what could they do instead? I know, how about bringing the guy behind Car Rangers? Yeah, series composition was helmed by Yoshio Urasawa, a writer most well known for stuff like Bobo Bo, Fushigi Yugi, and the comedic Super Sentai that was meant to cheer people up after the dumpster fire that was Japan in 1995, Gekiso Sentai Car Ranger. A trend that they would unfortunately need to repeat a few more times. But yeah, Car Ranger was an outright parody of Super Sentai that by 1995 had developed a lot of tropes and cliches that deserved to be poked fun at. And while I haven't seen it myself, it does seem to be fairly well received, and at least from what I saw with their Golkaiju episode that was also written by Urasawa, it seems like it was pretty darn hilarious. And just imagine if they tried to take that source material and make a more serious story out of it. Yeah. Point is, Urasawa does have a good sense of humor and a knack for parody, likely both things he developed while working with Navishin on stuff like Tokyo Pig and Nerima Daikon Brothers. Though to make sure he stayed a little on track, Toei also brought in Takashi Yamada, still fairly fresh off completing the Ojama Doremi franchise to handle the screenplay. Other notable toy writers include Yumi Kageyama, Kento Shimomiya, Mio Inoue, and Isao Murayama. Yeah, some of his earliest magical girl work alongside Splash Star at the time was this parody of the genre. Seems a bit counterintuitive, but really that's toy in a nutshell. The character designer, which is almost always one of the most important positions for the PBG, again aside from the reboot, was decided through auditions. Ultimately, they went with Miho Shimogasa, a longtime Sailor Moon animator, and Ultramaniac and Cutie Honey F designer. Some of her initial designs look straight up like the OG, which again, thankfully, they strayed away from and slowly but surely went in their own unique directions. 
Ultimately, they settled on something reminiscent of the OG with the big bug eyes, but still their own creation. I think even Shimogasa fell in love with these designs, and she would even use them as the basis for her designs in Bow Spirit's Shonen Topa Bashin, the card game anime. I'd swear you think these two shows took place in the same universe. For voice acting, they chose not to go with any of the Japanese dub cast of the OG series. I'd imagine it's because some of them, especially the main heroines, came with higher price tags that weren't in the show's limited budget. Thus, they opted for some more up-and-coming talents for the girls. Machiko Kawana would play the buttercup of the series, and unfortunately wouldn't do much else with her career afterwards. Nami Miyahara, yet another Doremi alumni. See, there's a reason why I'm doing this alongside those reviews played yet another twin tail blonde with this show's version of Bubbles. And last and certainly not least, this show's version of Blossom was played by Emiri Kato. Which I gotta say, good for her as I've heard she's a big fan of Magical Girls. And really, it's probably the closest she'll ever get to playing a Precure, because while Kato did end up going on to have the most decorated career of these actresses, her voice is also now forever associated with the Space Bunny. Been a while since I busted this thing out. Last thing we'll cover for today will be the director they chose, Iko Ishigoro. A bit of a veteran in the industry who has worn many hats for shows like Gegege no Kitaro and Toriko. More importantly, he was a co-founder of the animation studio Doga Kobo that helped provide a little extra work for the show along with the regular toy animation. Again, it probably helped to compensate for their more frugal budget. Makes you kind of wonder why they don't do more work with Doga Kobo. Oh, I kid though, I like their shows and know for a fact that they have done a lot more work for Toy after this series, including some of the better Precure movies. So hey, there's another reason why this series is relevant to one of my favorite franchises that I cover on this channel. So with a fairly interesting little history like that, as well as a fairly stacked cast and staff, how did the final product turn out? Well, come back next time when we'll cover the first episode of this series and get at least half of these girls' origin story, you'll see what I mean. Following that, the Doremi reviews will continue on an alternating schedule. And until then though, farewell for now my friends and um, hold on, uh, let's see here. Hello? Please save me! Save you from what, sir? Uh, hello? Hello, um, eh, freaking telemarketer.